Yes, I was the eldest of five boys in the f um, my family, and uh, I'm the only one left. Oh yeah, which is rather strange. Yeah, but uh, we grew up as a very happy family in the countryside in uh, South Australia, at a little place called Mylor, and went to school at uh, a one-teacher school, and the total number of uh, students was uh, about 20, and varying, of course, from beginners at school up to those who were about to move to high school. Yeah. What year were you born, uh, Dr. Oliphant? Uh, I was born on the 8th of October, 1901. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, and the others uh, followed uh, to pretty regular intervals after that. Oh, yeah. So, and uh, uh, what was the size of the town? Uh, it there was a the... tiny village. Yeah. Uh, as I said, the total number of students in the school was 24. Yeah. And uh, we had a, a wonderful time because the teacher was an extraordinarily intelligent man, a man named McCaffrey, an Irishman. Oh, yeah. Who was a great lover of music and of literature, and he taught us uh, very much to love uh, good music and good uh, good reading. Mm. So you had a, a good start in the in the fundamentals. That's uh, right. But now, when it came to time for me to go to high school, of course, there was no high school in the countryside, so uh, we had to move to. Uh, the city of Adelaide. Oh, yes. Where I went to high school. First of all, in one of the suburbs called Unley, and then moved for the fourth year of high school to uh, Adelaide High School. Oh, yes. And uh, from there to the University of Adelaide, where I uh, earned my keep, uh, my way through the university by being, first of all, a cadet, as they called it, in the public library. Mm. I was a librarian. Oh, yeah. And uh, secondly, as a, uh, what they called a, a, uh, an assistant in the university. Now, I started out life with the idea of being a clergyman. Oh, yeah. My father was very religious and uh, in a nice way. It was not bigoted or any way, but he was uh, very keen for me to become a, a uh, Church of England clergyman. Yes, well, apparently uh, you and Charles Darwin uh, <laughs> had the same sort of... Uh, Charles Darwin was actually trained as a clergyman. Yes, well, but... I, I did a great deal of Latin and Greek in preparation for this, <laughs> but then decided that I'd rather be a doctor. Oh, yes. So then I changed over to the medical course and uh, the professor of uh, biochemistry, a man named Brasford Robertson, invited me to join him right at the beginning. He uh, knew I was interested in gadgets uh, oh, yeah. and he wanted to prove that uh, animals, mice in this case, uh, uh, used some nitrogen from the air itself directly and didn't get all their nitrogenous substances from their food. So the problem was to keep uh, mice for many generations in an atmosphere of argon and oxygen instead of, of, uh, uh, of uh, nitrogen and oxygen, which uh, I undertook the... Uh, to make this work. Yes, it was, that was a very difficult, uh, difficult problem. Yes, yeah, uh, yeah, so uh, you know, finding out how to mm -hmm. keep the concentration of oxygen correct, which yeah. I did by uh, a technique of measuring the heat conductivity of the gas. Oh, yes. And made a bridge circuit mm -hmm. so that uh, relays worked and opened valves to let in either oxygen or argon and keep the temperature constant. Then, of course, one had to remove all the products of metabolism oh, yes. uh, from the uh, uh, gas as it mm -hmm. circulated and make arrangements for introducing food and for removing the feces and so on yeah. uh, 
uh, without letting any uh, nitrogen into the system. Mm -hmm. So it was quite a complicated piece of well, apparatus. Very complicated. And it must have been uh, And it very went tedious. on and on for weeks and weeks and weeks, of course. Oh, yeah. But uh, the result was, of course, that uh, the uh, animals uh, got all their nitrogen yeah. from their food. Oh, yes. Uh, but it was a very interesting introduction oh, to me. Yes, and of course and that's I a got very... so interested in the gadgetry that I decided that uh, physics was my uh, thing. So I did, uh, from then on, I did physics and chemistry. Mm. Oh, yeah. And mathematics, of course. Mm -hmm. But I always, uh, strangely enough, I always came top of chemistry in mm -hmm. all the examinations. Oh, yeah. And uh, did rather indifferently in uh, examinations in physics, although it was my uh, first... Uh, uh, Reason, as it yeah. were, for first love in life. Yes. Did you uh, actually become interested in physics even in high school, or did they you not have any? Uh, yes, we had it, but I was not any more interested in physics than in yeah. biology mm -hmm. or oh, anything yeah. else. Uh, it was just one of the things that one did. Mm. So your interest in physics then did not really intensify until you got to the university? No, no until I got to the university and began to use it, you see, in yeah. this experiment. Yeah. So I, uh, after that, I really concentrated on physics. And then I took my first degree and then an honors degree in physics. And then I stayed on for a year or two with... Uh, the professor as his assistant mm. to uh, do some experiments in surface tension actually oh, yeah. the surface tension of mercury oh yeah and the uh, there's some rather remarkable things happen with the surface of mercury <coughs> when it's truly clean mm. the uh, adsorption of uh, ions and of uh, mm -hmm. from a solution for instance and the spreading mm -hmm. of liquids mm -hmm. on the surface oh yeah investigated all these things. Uh, that was good fun, but very simple mechanical yeah. physics oh, yes. it were, and optics uh, to uh, measure the uh, surface tension by the drop method. Yes, you know. mm -hmm. yeah. uh, very classical physics. Uh, yes, very classical physics. <laughs> but then in 1925, uh, Rutherford... Uh, had been to see his old mother in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And the ship uh, that was taking him back to England called in at Adelaide, mm -hmm. and uh, he came up to the university and gave a lecture. And we, I went along and he gave a lecture on the experimental work that was going on in the Cavendish at that time. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And I was absolutely fascinated. I made up my mind that that was the man I was going to work with. So I uh, set to work. First of all, I thought, well, now this is all very well, but uh, I'd better show that I'm interested in uh, the nucleus and in radioactivity. Mm -hmm. And I reckoned that uh, if one, if uh, uranium underwent its first uh, transformation by emitting an alpha particle, that one could reverse this by uh, uh, by uh, putting a, an electron in. Oh yes, and With that. The, uh, so uh, I set up a uh, a uh, sort of old X-ray tube. Coolidge X-ray tube, oh, yes. which I cut mm -hmm. the end off, and then I put a target in it of uranium oxide, which I had carefully, uh, chemically removed the uranium X, the oh, yes. product, mm -hmm. and uh, bombarded with electrons in the hope of uh, restoring the yeah. material. What the but the uh, uh, experiment was, of course, a silly one. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, in light of what we know now, yes, <laughs> yeah. but uh, not so silly uh, no, no, at, no. at that uh, time. From, and the, from the point of view <coughs> of charges, yeah. it was all right. Yes. But from the point of view, of course, of, uh, of uh, anything entering yeah. the nucleus, particularly yeah. an electron entering yeah. the nucleus, it was ridiculous. But still, it, it was my introduction. Yes, to, uh, of course. Uh, the yeah. thing. And then I was 
lucky enough to be awarded an 1851 exhibition scholarship, which was the same scholarship as had taken Rutherford to the Cavendish. Oh, yes. And uh, this provided uh, me with uh, uh, my fees and very modest amount of money for books and so on. Uh, I decided that the right thing to do was to get married before I left, uh, mm. and uh, of course I uh, was awarded also a uh, free passage. In those days, the shipping lines together awarded two free passages to the University of Adelaide uh, for students going abroad to further their education. And I was lucky enough to be awarded one of these, so I got a free passage. Yes, well, that uh, has helped a lot. I for my wife. Yes. And we <laughs> went to England round the uh, Cape, round Cape Town, mm -hmm. round Africa, and they were fascinated by this. The voyage took seven weeks. Oh, yes. To Cape Town, Durban, and Tenerife in the Canary <laughs> Islands, and then on to... Uh, Liverpool. We landed at Liverpool in England and then in a boat train across to London mm -hmm. and then from London up to Cambridge. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, fine. So you uh, then, uh, you now were e entering your graduate school uh, work and, uh, and your first, uh, first experiments were with the, essentially a bombardment with electrons. What energy electrons were you able to get out? Or, uh, About 100,000 volts. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, Low energies by our modern standards. Yes, I was just uh, using old X ray equipment. Yes. Actually, uh, mm -hmm. an induction coil. Oh, yes. A That's large right. induction oh, yes. coil. Mm -hmm. All right. But the. Uh, uh, when I reached the Cavendish, I uh, did some experiments that were not on nuclear physics uh, directly, but. Uh, an attempt electromagnetically to separate the isotopes of potassium because of potassium-41 is mm -hmm. radioactive, yes. as you mm -hmm. remember. Yes. And uh, we wanted to know more about mm -hmm. the uh, radioactivity of this uh, mm -hmm. isotope. Using normal potassium, of course, to get uh, mm -hmm. a reasonable uh, number of <coughs> counts <coughs> In those days, of course, one has to remember mm -hmm. one had the Geiger counter only right. in a very primitive form yeah. for uh, observing electrons or else an ionization chamber. And yeah. secondly, well, for uh, alpha particles, one used the scintillation screen. Oh, yes. And uh, this was, of course, uh, quite a, uh, a uh, difficult mm -hmm. process because one had to get one's eyes completely uh, dark adapted yeah. in, and one could count for, provided the counts weren't coming mm -hmm. too quickly, for mm -hmm. uh, perhaps 20 minutes or half an hour at a time, and oh, then yeah. had to hand over to somebody else. Oh, yeah. So we had to have two or three people involved. <laughs> Yes, in, you mean... In, uh, and work in absolute darkness. Yes, that must have been very terribly difficult. <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah, but and still it was a it good was, uh, introduction to solid hard work. That's right. Because uh, one, in the Cavendish laboratory, you know, one had to make all one's own equipment, all one's oh, yes. own apparatus. Mm -hmm. uh, practically nothing was available that was built except a few you know, hand meters and voltmeters and things like that. Yeah. But uh, all one had to do one's own glass blowing. Oh, yeah. And uh, uh, making things out of metal. And the uh, fact that the uh, large amount of the equipment was made with uh, old cocoa and uh, other tins and... Uh, <laughs> Sailing wax and string. Yes, and well, that uh, I, I think it today's was... graduate students don't have that opportunity. Uh, no. to, I remember my graduate work. I had to construct a uh, 
glass electrode pH meters, uh, yeah. you know, from where well, there weren't any for sale at that time. No. <laughs> now they sell them by the millions. Uh, no, then, you but, had uh, to uh, blow your own thin glass. Yes, or? oh yes, <laughs> and uh, uh, the good old Corning 015 glass, uh, yeah. plus uh, do all of the electronics and so yeah. on. But it was great, a uh, great deal of fun. And, yeah. uh, uh, of course, today, there was no electronics in my time. Yes. It was, uh, you, you used uh, mm -hmm. uh, very primitive instruments. Oh, and, yes. Uh, the, uh, as I said, the uh, spintheroscope zinc yeah. oxide, oh, yeah. zinc sulfide mm -hmm. screen for observing alpha particles. Did you uh, ever use the uh, electroscope? Uh, the uh, electro, uh, no, used uh, uh, the ordinary. Uh, yeah. Gold leaf electroscope. Yes. Mm -hmm. That was uh, a standard instrument. Yes. And mm -hmm. putting the gold leaf onto the instrument, of course, every now and again one put too big a charge on it and blew oh. the leaf off. Oh, yeah. So you had to get rather skilled at putting this gold leaf on. The oh, yes. Uh, I, I used the Lauritsen electroscope, which is a go essentially a gold leaf, yes. gold plated. And, uh, and uh, Glenn Seaborg used uh, the Lawrence electroscope too. Yeah. <laughs> no electronics, no nothing. Uh, no, no. <laughs> uh, so. Nothing of that sort, nothing complicated. <laughs> and then uh, uh, later on, uh, after I'd got my uh, doctorate and so on, uh, Rutherford uh, suggested to me that I should, uh, and Cockcroft and Walton had done their first experiment and shown that one could disintegrate lithium with accelerated uh, mm -hmm. protons. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> and uh, John Cockcroft and I were very great friends. Mm -hmm. So uh, I uh, built a small equipment to mm -hmm. investigate the low energy side of mm -hmm. these uh, disintegrations of light elements produced by proton bombardment. Oh, yes. Because they always tailed off in a way mm -hmm. that uh, Cockcroft and Walton found it very difficult with their 600,000 volts or so to uh, follow the curve. So we undertook the bottom part of the curve and they did the uh, main part of the curve. And this was very interesting because uh, we were able, of course, to uh, make careful measurements now and uh, get to cross sections for disintegrations and the variation of cross section with accelerating voltage, mm -hmm. and uh, also to work out uh, exactly what was happening. One of the first really interesting disintegrations that we investigated was that of. Uh, of uh, uh, boron with uh, protons. Mm -hmm. It splits into three alpha particles. Oh, yes. Uh, and therefore, the, the three alpha particles go off, you see, in different directions. Mm -hmm. And the way in which they share the energy depends upon the, uh, the angle between them. Oh, yes. So that the energy of the alpha particles we observed varied from zero to... Uh, to a maximum yeah. and this in, it took quite a bit of working out uh, what the total energy uh, was that was released in the uh, in the uh, disintegrations uh, what, uh, see your, your protons then were accelerated to approximately what energy uh, oh, were you uh, using at uh, that time anything from uh, mm -hmm. two or three thousand mm -hmm. volts yeah. up yeah. to uh, Oh yes. Yeah. So yeah. with with quite low energy protons, so you energy, you got the yeah. uh, essentially it was boron eleven, was it, or something like that? Yeah. Uh, boron uh, eleven became boron twelve, yeah. and, 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 and then into split into your three, three alphas, three uh, alpha. uh, essentially tri trinary fission almost. That's <laughs> right. That's right. And it was uh, <sighs> that was the first uh, really fascinating one. Yeah. But then uh, at that time. We had a visit in the laboratory in uh, early 1934, I think it was, uh, from G.N. Lewis from oh, yes. Berkeley, who presented <clears throat> Rutherford with two drops 
each a fifth of a cubic centimeter of his, his pure heavy water that he made. Oh, yes. Deuterium oxide. And uh, we couldn't uh, waste a moment in uh, extracting the uh, mm -hmm. deuterium from one of these, uh, the deuterium gas. Did it uh, by uh, just reacting with uh, some uh, potassium metal. Oh, yes. And he well, only gave us half of the gas, but uh -huh. still, it turned out to be a good, very good thing because uh, we used the gas, a uh, small amount of gas that was available, mm -hmm. to bombard various elements and immediately got very interesting results yeah. at very low accelerating yeah. voltages. Uh, but strangely enough, no matter what target we put in, whether it was uh, lithium or whether it was iron, mm -hmm. copper or something of that mm -hmm. sort, we always got a group of, uh, after time, we always got a group of uh, protons that uh, were emitted mm -hmm. with a, an in, uh, rather l big range, about mm -hmm. 13 or 14 centimeters in mm -hmm. air. Oh, yes. Which made them quite energetic, mm -hmm. but since they were singly charged, they went a long way through air. Mm -hmm. We measured the ranges by putting in the way between the uh, spin theroscope and the, uh, and the uh, uh, target a uh, uh, series of micas which had been split. In, weighed carefully, yeah. we knew the equivalent air stopping power of air, and this enabled one to get the range. And splitting the micas was uh, good fun, because one had to split them right down to showing very vivid interference fringes, uh, in order yeah. to get the uh, uh, millimeter or less of air equivalent oh, yeah. of stopping power. But this was, uh, this was, one could do it was all right, and one gradually accumulated a set of uh, micas, yeah. which one was able to use in turn yeah. and have in a little bobbin arrangement, so that one could just turn a piece of cardboard around yeah. and put the one that you wanted oh, wonderful. in position. So that uh, that uh, deuterium and your deuterons uh, were a very useful tool. Then. Yes, and, uh, it was, uh, and but then. Uh, we puzzled over this mm -hmm. fact that we always got this uh, long-range yeah. thing. And then mm -hmm. I realized that it was all sort of thought. It must be just that mm -hmm. the deuterium, because it took time to appear. Oh, yeah. It must be due to the fact that the deuterium was sticking onto the target and we were hitting deuterium. Mm -hmm. So then I took the uh, potassium hydroxide, which mm -hmm. had uh, been produced in the... Uh, making the, the deuterium, yes. or deuteride, I should yes. say, <laughs> and uh, uh, used it as a target, mm -hmm. and straightway got enormous uh, numbers of these particles without any trouble at all. And uh, it was obvious that this was uh, due to, uh, uh, since the proton was being produced, yes. and, uh, by that time, we were very skilled from in uh, recognizing particles oh, from yes. their ionization that they mm -hmm. produced. So that one knew whether a particle was singly charged or doubly charged. And uh, the uh, one was getting proton coming out with uh, considerable energy, and uh, there had to be another particle. Yes. Which so, we uh, of, uh, a, of a three. range. <laughs> yes. And this would, would, <coughs> this, of course, was hydrogen of mm -hmm. uh, mass three. Yeah. So that uh, we were uh, was. Uh, so yeah. we were uh, uh, quite happy about mm -hmm. it. Uh, there, the charges and the masses all added up oh, nicely, yes. and the energy came out quite uh, nicely from E equal m c squared. Oh yeah. And the uh, from the mass masses which had been deduced by, uh, with his mass spectrograph in the Cavendish by Aston, you know. Oh, yes. The first mm -hmm. measurer. 
His values were not very good. We were able mm -hmm. to correct them by, mm -hmm. from the disintegration yeah. data later on. But uh, this was uh, very exciting, of course. But there was a very short-range group of doubly charged particles, obviously alpha particles, coming out uh, when we had a thin enough window on the mm -hmm. equipment and right. only a few millimeters yeah. of range in air. Yeah. And uh, these intrigued us as to what on earth they could be. Mm -hmm. Now, what one's got to realize is that all this time we were working with our faces that far from the target, you see. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's oh, yeah, it's very, very difficult. Uh, <laughs> but not exactly. only that, uh, unknown to us, of course, our, we were bathed in an atmosphere of neutrons. <laughs> yes, that's right. Because of... this uh, very short-range... Uh, group of particles puzzled us, you see, mm -hmm. alpha particles, because yeah. we didn't, uh, we couldn't say uh, anything of mass four, you see, yeah. it was the only alpha no. particle known, you yeah. see, could uh, uh, originate in these reactions. Mm -hmm. And uh, one night after puzzling about it, Rutherford came down and talked to us and uh, looked at our records, we were by that time, we were using an ionization chamber, which uh, gave pulses a grinding mm -hmm. mm -hmm. type. Well, could you see the uh, the energy then uh, on an oscilloscope or, or yes, yes, on yes, a uh, mechanical oscilloscope, uh, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, with bromide, yeah. uh, strip uh, bromide paper that oh, went yes. past and mm -hmm. reeled up, working in a dark room. Yes, and the. Uh, it was very funny with Rutherford because he was very interested in these results. And uh, he, in, uh, of course, one had to develop the bromide paper and then fix it. Yes. Uh, before one, uh, and dry it. Yes. And he used to insist if he came down and we got some interesting results and the, the stuff was still in the fixer, he'd insist on uh, holding the stuff out of the fixer before it was properly fixed. Oh, yes. <laughs> he'd put it on the table and he'd sit there and he smoked all the time. He smoked <laughs> a pipe all the time. And uh, he used to dry his tobacco out till it was uh, completely dried in front mm -hmm. of the fire at home. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was so, his pipe was like a volcano. It was uh, oh, yeah. all uh, yeah. ashes and, and bits of... Uh, fire coming out of his pipe all the time, which he smoked continuously. And he'd lean over this, uh, these precious records of ours, dropping uh, ash all over them. <laughs> then he carried in his uh, waistcoat pocket that time a little stubby pencil about that length, mm -hmm. about an inch and a quarter long, which he, uh, he cut his pencils up into this length. He, he liked to write with them. Oh, that's, a, that's an interesting yeah. point. And uh, he would uh, make, try to make marks on these wet records with this st stub of pencil. And of course, it usually went through the bromide paper. <laughs> oh, it was an awful mess. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, so so we a... used to pray that Rutherford wouldn't come in while we were working. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, uh, we... Uh, one day we uh, had uh, measured very carefully the energy of the, or the range rather, of these little alpha particles and uh, couldn't fiddle out what they were due to and uh, went off about six o'clock in the evening. Rutherford didn't believe in people working after six o'clock. He said the evening's the time for thinking. Oh, yes. That's an interesting, very interesting point. There. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, we went home and I f fiddled around with uh, what this might be uh, could get nowhere mm -hmm. that night. And at three o'clock in the morning, the telephone rang. My wife got heard it and got out. I was a bit deaf even in those days. Now I have to wear hearing aids. But uh, he, uh, she got up and answered the telephone. She came to me and said, uh, the professor wants to speak to you. So I went to the uh, telephone and uh, 
rather have said, uh, uh, elephant. He always said, uh, uh, <laughs> before he started speaking. Uh, uh, I think I know what those little particles are. And uh, so I said, what are they, Professor? And he said, oh, they're, they're uh, helium of mass three. And I said, helium of mass three? I said, how on earth can two plus two equal three? You see? <laughs> I said, how do you, uh, what reason have you for it? Mm -hmm. He said, reasons, reasons, elephant. He said, I feel it in my water. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, well, fantastic. He had, a great, uh, he had great faith that his... <laughs> But yeah, he'd been history. thinking of it. Yes. See, this was mm -hmm. like him, you see. Yes. It was three mm -hmm. in the morning yes. when this it's, happened. Yeah. Oh. Well, next morning, uh, I set to work, and of course, mm -hmm. I put these little particles through mm -hmm. crossed electric and magnetic mm -hmm. field mm -hmm. and uh, showed that they were yeah. indeed particles of mass three. Yeah, determined the, uh, the mass the, three. Of yes, that mass three mass. Mm -hmm. helium. Yes. So we had mass three yeah. hydrogen uh -huh. and mass three helium as yes. a result of these experiments with uh, with two drops of uh, heavy water. Right? Yes. Well, uh, see, in, in this reaction, then uh, of course uh, you would get uh, uh, one of the reactions would be uh, D D uh, forming uh, uh, mass three helium and and a proton was it then and a neutron and a neutron yeah. yes. Now then, and, you see, that immediately alerted yeah. us mm -hmm. to the fact that uh, yes. if we had uh, high helium of mass 3, then there had to be a neutron. Oh, yes. And then we looked for the neutrons, and of course they were there. Yeah, I, yeah. I made a, an ionization chamber, helium ionization chamber, with helium as a pressure of uh, mm -hmm. 10 atmospheres or so. Oh, yes. And uh, uh, measured the... Uh, the ionization produced by the knocked on helium yeah. atoms. Oh, yeah. And uh, these varied, of course, uh, uh, from zero up yeah. to uh, mm -hmm. a maximum, as one would expect from yeah. ordinary scattering. And uh, but from the maximum of the curve, one got the energy of the particle. Yeah. And these, uh, this was, of course, in accord with the momentum yeah. of the. Uh, yeah. Uh, helium of mass three. Yeah. So uh, we had the thing tied up beautifully, and uh, of course this resulted in a bit of an argument with Ernest Lawrence, oh, yeah. who had uh, postulated that the uh, reason for these protons, he'd seen the protons only, uh, was that the uh, de deuteron uh, broke up in a high yeah. energy collision into mm -hmm. a, a proton and a neutron. Oh, yeah. And uh, uh, we uh, had a little bit of an argument which was sorted out in the end yeah. at the, uh, at the uh, Solvay conference. Oh, yes. So was there a, uh, also a, a perhaps a small chance or a small yield of uh, uh, tritium Plus the proton. Is there an, I, uh, I've already said that. Yes. That there was uh, these yes. long-range particles. Of, yes. Were accompanied by the long-range, short-range, the short, yeah, tr and the short-range is the particles. tritium. Yes. Yes. And so we so, got both helium three and hydrogen yes. three. And so out of the experiment. Was that the first uh, real? Uh, uh, Observation. Uh, observation of helium three. Yes, and of, the, and of hydrogen. And of hydro, and of yeah. tritium, uh, yeah. uh, too. So, so uh, we uh, were uh, we were rather pleased with that. Yes, that that is tremendous uh, yeah. development there, and uh, so uh, in fact that is the first thermonuclear reaction. Yes, but mm -hmm. do we uh, also the reaction took place at such low bombarding energies? Yes that I immediately thought, well, perhaps uh, one can get more energy out of this reaction than one puts in and oh, yes. produce it. So Rutherford was going off to uh, South Africa. They had a meeting of the British Association for the Advancement of Science in South Africa. Oh, yes. Right he went off, and while he was away, I made a piece of equipment in which yeah. one could... Uh, uh, 
bombard uh, a deuterium gas mm -hmm. with uh, deuterons. Yeah. And uh, uh, have them completely absorbed in the deuterium in the uh, yeah. gas, so the mm -hmm. chance of any other reaction than DD was zero. Yes. I thought uh, that one, by measuring the energy that was produced uh, calorimetrically, one mm -hmm. could uh, perhaps uh, observe more energy than was put in. Yeah. But of course, uh, the amount, total amount of energy that was produced was so minute that uh, it was quite clear to us that, uh, that there was no hope of uh, this being a source of energy. Anyway, when uh, Rutherford came back from uh, South Africa and came and talked to me about what I'd been doing in the meantime, and I told him of this experiment, he was terribly angry with me. Oh, is that right? He was very yeah. angry with me by having tried to produce net energy. Uh. Uh, he was dead scared, you see, that this or some equivalent yeah, result would enable nuclear energy to be set free. Oh, yes. As I mentioned in my talk earlier in the week, the uh, uh, Rutherford in 1916 had become aware of the possibility of the release of nuclear energy. Oh yes, as early as 1916, he, he was... Yes. Uh, He'd given a talk yeah. in which he said that uh, he pointed out the enormous energies that were released in mm -hmm. radioactive transformations, mm -hmm. millions of electron yes. volts, as uh, in chemical reactions it was uh, less than an electron volt in general. Yes. And so consequently there was the possibility of the production of larger quantities of energy it, if one could make could bring about radioactive change uh, at will. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, there are those amongst my colleagues who wish to produce this, these reactions at will. He said, I hope it never happens in my lifetime or some silly fool will blow the world to pieces. Oh, right, that's a very <laughs> interesting observation. That was 1916. 1916, uh, during the First World War. That was amazing. Yeah. Right there, so so uh, he was fully aware of this and dead scared of yeah. it always, mm -hmm. you see, and he hated the idea for two reasons. First of all, he, uh, he saw the dangers. Yes. But secondly, he <laughs> thought, and he was right that it would destroy nuclear physics as a yeah. as an ivory tower oh, yes. <laughs> area <laughs> of research. Yes. Well, of course, uh, uh, there at the Cavendish Laboratory, uh, the, the tremendous advances in in pure science uh, yeah. there, and uh, so apparently. Uh, he uh, he really devoted his life to uh, thinking about pure science and uh, pure yes. Uh, although now he was very uh, see he was the chairman of the what's uh, which is called the department of uh, uh, department of DS department of science and industri scientific and industrial research. That's mm. right. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was the chairman. Oh yes. Of that. So uh, so and yeah. uh, with him, yeah. I became my wife and I became very close to the Rutherfords. Oh yes. And uh, we used to go for holidays with them on the continent, and mm -hmm. they had a cottage in Wales where oh, yeah. we spent time with them. And uh, so we knew them uh, mm -hmm. very intimately mm -hmm. in the end. And uh, Rutherford was. Uh, uh, his whole life was his science. Yeah. It uh, nothing else interested him very much at all, and he was uh, very conservative in his thinking about uh, politics or social. Uh, oh yes, uh, things, uh, and uh, used to poke fun at me mm. because I was <laughs> more. Uh, <laughs> 
sympathetic towards uh, more progressive ideas. Yes. Yeah. Well, I guess in the early days you'd call him uh, one of the Tory uh, group. No, he no, wasn't a wasn't Tory. He was a liberal. Liberal. Yes, uh, uh, in between yes, the, uh, uh, the left people yes. and the uh, mm -hmm. Tories. Uh, he was a he was a liberal. He was a liberal-minded man, but he wasn't uh, he wasn't uh, at all interested in those things. Oh yes, they passed him by. The mm. thing that mattered was science oh, yeah. <laughs> for him, and he was a man also who had a, a great fun uh, fund of uh, stories um, mm. of various sorts, which he uh, used to entertain people with at the high table at Trinity College where he was uh, uh, a member of Trinity College yeah. and uh, used to, had a great reputation because he had a big booming voice. And once he began to talk, nobody else had uh, a okay. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> yes. Well, he was a marvelous, uh, marvelous scientist and uh, with uh, 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 the laboratory there, which he founded, had, had tre such tremendous yeah. contributions over such oh, a long period. Oh, he didn't period. found the Cavendish Laboratory. Oh, uh, who the founded Cavendish it? The Cavendish Laboratory was uh, founded by Lord Cavendish. Oh, I see. So and, that, uh, it's always that first, old, goes way uh, back in history. <laughs> the first uh, uh, director of the laboratory was Maxwell. Oh, yes. And then he was followed by... Uh, uh, by, uh, you know, the celebrated uh, man who measured the ohm and so on and did so much uh, to work out, uh, Lord uh, Rayleigh. Rayleigh. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Rayleigh were, was the second director. Oh, yes. Then J.J. Uh, J. Thompson, yes. who discovered the electron, electron. Mm -hmm. member in 1894, was it? Yes. yes. And... Uh, no, 1896, mm. he discovered the electron. And uh, uh, Rutherford went to work with him in the same sort of way as I'd gone to work with Rutherford uh, in uh, 1895. Yeah. Rutherford turned up there to work with him. And uh, uh, Thompson was, J.J. Uh, Thompson was very interested in the uh, whether the nature of the ionization produced by the recently discovered radioactive materials, oh, yeah. uh, thorium and uh, uranium, mm -hmm. uh, whether the radiations from these substances produced ionization that was the same mm -hmm. as that produced by passing an electric discharge through gases. Oh, he yeah. put Rutherford onto that. And that's what started Rutherford off on the study oh, yeah. of the radiations from uh, mm -hmm. from uranium and uh, thorium. Yeah. And uh, shortly afterwards, uh, Rutherford, of course, moved to uh, Montreal, mm -hmm. where he did his fundamental work in disentangling the yeah. uh, transformation of uranium all the way down to lead. You see. Yes. Mm -hmm. First of all, into radium and the actinium series and then mm. into lead mm. of a particular mass, 206, yeah. which differentiated from ordinary lead. Yes. Uh, but uh, that was that was such a fundamental dis discovery, uh, that getting that whole, with, uh, that, that whole done series the, done. Uh, the, that was done with the aid mm. of Soddy, yes. who was uh, mm -hmm. Afterwards, became a professor yeah. in Oxford. Yes, and Hahn, who was uh, to be the discoverer of uh, 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 fission. Uh, yes, uh, very, very distinguished group there. They were the chemists who assisted yes. him in yes. uh, identifying the yeah. materials, the disintegration materials, which he separated yeah. uh, by chemical means. Yes, well, that uh, uh, I was also, uh, of course, uh, you, you mentioned the, the you were able to identify neutrons from your DD reaction, uh, and uh, of course, uh, uh, you worked with uh, Chadwick also uh, during that period yeah. of the discovery of the neutron. That's right. Uh, Chadwick, uh, you see, was Rutherford's offsider. Mm -hmm. He was the man who really uh, looked after us. 
Hoya, who were doing research, and uh, he, a uh, postgraduate student, mm -hmm. and he used to, uh, uh, you know, it was strange. The first piece of equipment I built, uh, one had to evacuate it by a uh, hand operated uh, oil pump, oh, yeah. floist pump, mm -hmm. turning a handle. Oh, yeah. This was a lot. Very difficult, you see. Oh to, yes, to get down to low enough pressure for the primitive uh, Langmuir diffusion pumps to oh, yeah. take over and give yes. us a decent vacuum. And uh, so I thought that I'd like to have one of these new gadgets that I'd seen one or two people in the lab had called a high vac pump. Oh yeah. And I said to Chadwick once when uh, I was talking to him. Uh, you know, I'd like to have a high vac pump. And he said, thought for a moment, he said, well, you just can't have one. <laughs> <laughs> that was a very simple I answer. said, why? And he said, there isn't any money to buy it. Oh. So uh, I used to go home to my wife to lunch. Mm. And uh, I went home to lunch feeling a bit depressed, you see, that yeah. I wasn't able to mm -hmm. get one of these pumps. Yeah. And uh, uh, when I uh, got back again to the mm. lab, having had my lunch, uh, lo and behold, on my bench there was a high back pump. Oh, I, that's a wonderful that story. that taught me, you see, that uh, Chadwick's bite was worse than his <laughs> bark was oh, worse than his bite. That, that's a marvelous story about that he, it. Uh, at heart, he was a very, very nice man. And after yeah. that, we became very close friends. Oh, yes. And uh, I knew Chadwick extremely yeah. well. Now, there was another remarkable man working in the Cavendish at that time, uh, whose name was Kapitza, a Russian. Oh, yes. Now, Kapitza was interested in producing strong magnetic fields. Oh, yes. And he produced them initially by making uh, lead acid accumulators mm -hmm. uh, in a very simple manner. He'd take uh, uh, sheets of thin lead mm -hmm. and roll them up with some strips of insulating material between them until oh, yeah. he had a very large area oh, yes. of lead mm -hmm. uh, and make a roll that was perhaps uh, mm -hmm. 10 or 12 inches in diameter yeah. so that the area was uh, very big indeed. Oh, yes. Uh, many tens of square meters of mm -hmm. uh, lead foil yes. in them. And then he would charge them up by passing a uh, small yeah. current through them and then short circuit them through his coil yes. in order to get strong mm -hmm. magnetic fields. Uh, uh, he did this for a while but then uh, uh, he, he was an ingenious man and he got Metropolitan Vickers, the uh, electrical people, mm -hmm. to uh, design an alternator that uh, could be short circuited for just uh, mm -hmm. one half a cycle. Yes through his uh, system, and this uh, he did. Now, Kapitza was a, uh, a very ebullient man. He mm -hmm. never troubled to learn to speak English very well. Mm -hmm. uh, there are traces of uh, his inability to really master English in, uh, yeah. in uh, what's his name? Uh, you know, the man that uh, was on the panel last night. Uh, uh, you mean uh, Weinberg? Oh, Weinberg, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. No, Wigner. Wigner, yeah. Wigner, Wigner. Yeah. Vig yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but he, uh, but on the other hand, unlike Wigner, he spoke very rapidly. Oh yes. And uh, with this Russian German accent, and uh, it was, uh, it was really quite funny. His wife spoke perfect English. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. And, uh, yeah. of course, they had two children who grew up in England uh, mm -hmm. through their school yeah. years, uh, Sergei and uh, Andrew, both of whom are members now of the uh, Russian Academy of oh, Science. Oh, is that right? Yeah. They both became eminent scientists. Andrew, the, el the younger boy, became the head of their uh, Antarctic expeditions. Mm -hmm. and, uh, a professor of geography in uh, oh, yeah. Moscow State University. And Sergei, uh, after working for a time in uh, nuclear physics, became uh, Russia's uh, 
premier uh, TV uh, exponent on in science. He oh, runs a science show. Yeah, that that's a very interesting. Yeah. No, I had no idea that no. there's uh, yes, the, no, the two okay. of his sons and both of them speak English yeah. perfectly. Uh -huh. But uh, uh, Kapitza, this ebullient Kapitza, the story I wanted to tell was uh, when uh, Rutherford, when Chadwick, rather, discovered the neutron, yeah. uh, the uh, Kapitza had uh, founded a little club that met once a fortnight, and it was called the Kapitza Club, yeah. which met in the rooms college rooms of one of the members and uh, where we discussed the latest in uh, news of physics you see yeah. and both uh, practical and theoretical mm -hmm. and uh, it was a privilege to belong mm -hmm. to this little club yeah. because it had to be small in order to be yeah. held in somebody's room and he got uh, Chadwick, the day after Chadwick had uh, discovered the neutron, to give a talk to us. Now Chadwick, as I've told you already, was a rather doer sort of person. Mm -hmm. At first, a little frightening to young mm -hmm. uh, research students, but uh, really a man with a heart of gold. But uh, he was not uh, capable very easily of talking about his own work he hates to praise himself, as it were. Mm -hmm. But uh, Kapitza carefully took him to uh, dinner in Hall in Trinity before this talk and plied him very uh, vigorously with wine so that by the time uh, Chadwick arrived for his lecture, he was quite uh, tiddly. <laughs> oh, that's a fascinating and story. Then, so. uh, Chadwick spoke brilliantly about the uh, the way he had uh, heard of this uh, mm -hmm. fact that uh, the Joliot had uh, observed protons being knocked out by mm -hmm. from paraffin wax by uh, radiation produced mm -hmm. by neutron by some sort of radiation mm -hmm. that was coming from the bombardment of beryllium with uh, Alpha particles. Mm. And Chadwick had recognized at once this must be the elusive neutron, mm -hmm. which Rutherford had postulated must exist in 1921. Oh, yes. He first uh, yeah. predicted the neutron he that early, 10 neutron years. In 1921. Yeah. And he and uh, Chadwick had worked together on various experiments throughout the years in an attempt to detect these neutrons. They'd pass discharges through hydrogen yeah. gas in the hope yeah. that uh, that uh, they would yeah. find something. They'd uh, investigated every one of the known yeah. light element uh, alpha yeah. particle transformations mm -hmm. in the hope of seeing something, but had uh, detected nothing. Mm -hmm. But uh, having heard this story from Jolio, Chad was able, to, in two days, in, it only took him two days to yeah. do the experiments that uh, showed yeah. that these were neutrons. That's, that's remarkable. He uh, let them pass into, uh, from a, uh, a radium uh, beryllium source, mm -hmm. he had them pass into uh, various gases mm -hmm. and measured the... Uh, energy of the particles by their ionization yeah. that were produced and showed that the momentum change was exactly what you would expect yeah. of a particle with zero charge and uh, mass one. Yes. Yeah. Well, that was amazing. The Giulio Curie's uh, missed uh, both the uh, neutron <laughs> yes, they and had the fission. They had a little process <laughs> by which it was a, it was a sort of a, a transfer uh, an Auger effect, a yeah. sort of uh, yeah. um, effect of uh, gamma ray, you yeah. see, uh, on uh, and somewhere or other managed to uh, give large energy yeah. to uh, the proton. Yeah. Pity. Yes. Anyway, well, uh, but that's the way uh, uh, science course, advances. Yes. Somebody suddenly recognizes the uh, significance of something that's been missed yes. previously. 
Well, that, that's uh, been true all the way through science, I guess. Uh, you know, in the operation of the cyclotrons, you know, they get all this radioact residual radioactivity, and they thought it was their instruments and all that. Yes. So uh, it's very, very common in science. Uh, yes. Well, this is uh, uh, so uh, that takes you then. Uh, yeah, well, I suppose we stop for a moment here. And, yeah. All right. Uh, then, uh, of course, uh, uh, you uh, you were per participating in the Cavendish Laboratories when uh, all kinds of momentous uh, things came through, like artificial radioactivity, and uh, and then uh, later on uh, fission. And I, I was wondering what sort of reaction the announcement of uh, uh, of the discovery of fission uh, had at the yeah, laboratory. Yeah, well, that was, of uh, course, uh, towards the end mm -hmm. of my time. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, I think perhaps I should say a few words about the work of Cockroach and Walter. Oh, yes, that's right. Uh, the see, tremendous... Uh, Rutherford uh, 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 had uh, uh, done all his work with uh, alpha particles. Oh, yes. Uh, all the disintegration work with alpha particles, and he longed for a more copious source of particles. Yeah. He used to say uh, to people that he uh, wanted it, and he got into the laboratory a man named Ali Bone, who mm -hmm. was an electrical mm -hmm. engineer, a high voltage mm -hmm. electrical engineer, who built a an accelerator tube that was activated by the Tesla coil. Oh yes. And he produced high voltage, million volt uh, electrons with mm -hmm. it, but never produced any of any mm -hmm. uh, protons oh, or yes. heavy mm -hmm. particles. But about that time, when uh, Ali Bone had, uh, had developed the techniques of high voltage uh, yeah. applica yeah. application of high voltage to vacuum tubes. Uh, using the newly invented oil diffusion pumps, yeah. which came from Metropolitan Vickers, mm -hmm. where Birch had discovered these, mm -hmm. that one could uh, distill oils that uh, had very, very low vapor pressures. And he, uh, this was a great help in high voltage engineering, mm -hmm. vacuum engineering. So Aliban had introduced these to the laboratory and they were a great help to all of us. At Cockroft and, uh, w had been working on some simple experiments of iron implantation on surfaces. Yeah. And uh, uh, when we had a visit from Gamov, mm -hmm. Gamov from uh, Russia. Oh yes. And Gamow uh, came along with this idea of his, of this theory of the alpha particle emission being the burrowing through a potential barrier mm -hmm. of the wave uh, which represented the alpha particle mm -hmm. and uh, which had a finite amplitude on the other side of the potential barrier. And uh, the square of the amplitude represented the probability of the particle making the transition through the uh, yeah. potential barrier, you remember. Yes. And uh, he uh, had uh, worked this out in detail in quantum theory. Mm. And uh, a Schrodinger type of waves. And the uh, uh, Cockroft then calculated the uh, using Gamow's formula the probability that one could put protons into uh, beryllium. He mm -hmm. worked that out first yeah. of all and discovered that there was a chance, one in uh, uh, ten million or so, yeah. that a particle a proton would mm -hmm. penetrate into a, a light nucleus. Mm -hmm. So he thought it was worthwhile setting up an equipment to do this, and there were, he wanted he done the calculations for a million electron volts. Mm -hmm. So he invented uh, a cascade method of mm -hmm. producing the high voltage, mm -hmm. uh, the Cockroft-Walton mm -hmm. technique, and uh, 
built an equipment which was made out of those uh, uh, tubular uh, cylinders of glass that uh, were used on uh, gas pumps, you remember oh, in yeah. the old day. Mm -hmm. One pumped the uh, <laughs> uh, gas up until it reached a uh, mark on the yeah. thing and then it was let into the gas. Yeah. And these things were available commercially so they were used together with ordinary plasticine to make the vacuum joint round the oh, bottom. Oh, and, and that worked sheet of there. Metal. Yeah. Yeah. And with the aid of these oil diffusion pumps, one mm -hmm. could get the vacuum down after careful uh, uh, seasoning of the equipment for right. several days, one could oh, build yeah. the voltage up. Yes, uh, outgassing <laughs> for yeah, days out and so yeah. on. It's very familiar. Uh, yes. Till uh, one could get a reasonable voltage on. Yeah. And then they started doing experiments uh, measuring the range of these protons that they produced in various gases. Oh, yeah. And uh, Rutherford became very impatient with them and said, that's not what you should be doing, you see. We're not interested in the range. We know something about the range of protons in uh, yeah in uh, gases, uh, let's see whether they produce transformations. Oh, yeah. So he bullied them into putting mm -hmm. a light element in. They put mm -hmm. lithium in mm -hmm. straight away with a scintillation screen, saw oh, yeah. the alpha particles that were oh, yes. produced. Mm -hmm. And this, of course, produced great excitement. Yeah. And this was, of course, the same year, 1932, that mm -hmm. Chadwick discovered the neutron. Oh, yeah. And the same year as Anderson and Blackett discovered the positive electron. Positive electron, that's right. Well, that was a, All those three a, things, a, uh, three things one in, in one year yeah. uh, there. And, uh, really quite remarkable. But uh, Cockcroft and Walton went on to... Uh, do various experiments, mm -hmm. and I continued to do various experiments with and make measurements that were uh, to try and get yeah. cross sections and so on more yeah. accurately. Until uh, in 1937, uh, I went to uh, Italy to the celebrations of the uh, uh, anniversary of the discovery of. Uh, uh, voltaic electricity by oh, Galvani. Oh, yes. And while we were there, we got the news, Cockroft was there as well with me, we got the news that uh, Rutherford had died. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which upset us, and Bohr was there. Yeah. Bohr gave a magnificent speech to the mm -hmm. assembly just off the cuff, oh. first thing in the morning about the significance of Rutherford's work and uh, paid tribute to him. But uh, John Cockcroft and I went straight back to mm -hmm. Cambridge. Didn't wait for the rest of the conference. And uh, I discovered Lady Rutherford uh, very distraught. Yeah. And uh, uh, it turned out that he had a had uh, for, um, since his youth, he'd had a hernia mm -hmm. at the umbilicus. Oh, I see. Uh, and uh, he had uh, kept this under yeah. control just for the mm -hmm. pad, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, it had become strangulated. Oh, how terrible. And uh, mm -hmm. they'd got a surgeon instead of uh, having a local surgeon do mm -hmm. the operation. Mm -hmm. They brought a surgeon down from London mm -hmm. who came and uh, did the operation mm -hmm. and got in the train and went straight back to London. Oh. Then complications set in, the surgeon wasn't available, mm -hmm. Rutherford died. Oh, how terrible. He, Person, was only, he was only 67 years old. Yes, a similar thing with Ernest Lawrence. That's uh, right, same, very, same, same yeah, thing. Think, yeah. Except that Ernest, of course, died at the younger the age. The younger age, yes. Mm -hmm. But oh, very this tragic, upset yeah. us very much. and. Mm -hmm. uh, so I decided I didn't want to stay in the Cavendish uh, with somebody other than Rutherford as mm -hmm. the boss, and I moved to Birmingham. Oh, yes. Where I became the head of the physics department. In oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Rutherford died in 1937, and mm -hmm. I straightway made plans to build a cyclotron. 
Mm-hmm. Rutherford hated big machines. You see. Oh, I see. He but, never allowed yeah. us to build a cyclotron. Mm-hmm. But he, he did tolerate a Cockroft Walton yes, uh, the yeah. machine. Uh, but he but didn't just, like uh, the yeah. idea of big, heavy machine, yeah. oh, costly yeah. machine. The Cockroft Walton thing was very much a homemade thing, you see. Oh, yes. yes. It didn't uh, cost much at all. Mm-hmm. The transformer was just an uh, old X ray transformer. Yeah. The, uh, mm-hmm. The capacities were those that used in the X-ray machine. Yeah, it's all very simple. Mm-hmm. But uh, the idea of a cyclotron, for some reason, uh, worried him. He did in the end, just before he died, he mm-hmm. uh, yeah. gave permission to Cockroft to build a small cyclotron. Oh yeah. Unfortunately, they only built a small one. Mm-hmm. Uh, 30 inch or so. Oh, yes. Or one, one, one meter, one meter, yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, so I moved to Birmingham mm-hmm. and then uh, decided I would uh, build a cyclotron if I could get the money. And I managed to get the money from uh, uh, the uh, Mr. Morris, who'd become. Uh, uh, a very wealthy man building motor cars in Oxford. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. And the Morris motor car. Yes, that's right. And uh, he uh, mm-hmm. had uh, become a member of the House of Lords. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he uh, he gave me the money to mm-hmm. build a cyclotron. Mm-hmm. So I uh, went straight away, went across to Berkeley. Oh, yes. To came across in the mm-hmm. Queen Mary, and uh, which was very new at that yes. time, and uh, took the Santa Fe Railway across America oh, yes. by the mm-hmm. southern route to uh, San Francisco, and yeah. uh, to, rather to Berkeley, mm-hmm. or I think the, yes, the airplane, the uh, train did stop in Berkeley on its way to Oakland in yeah. those days. Yes, and, well, that uh, was, of course, uh, uh, height of activity on uh, with regard to cyclotrons in 1937. Right. So I, uh, mm-hmm. I spent most of 1938 with Ernest, mm-hmm. you see. Oh, yeah. And uh, uh, over Christmas of 1938, mm-hmm. I was there, too. Uh-huh. I uh, became familiar with all the boys, yeah. Ed McMillan and oh, yes. Grin and the rest of them, yes. Thornton. Mm-hmm so on, who were working with Ernest at that time, and uh, had the experience of operating the 37-inch. Oh, yes. He very kindly gave me the plans for his 60-inch, uh, oh, yes. copies of the plans mm-hmm. for his 60-inch. And uh, also, uh, everybody in the laboratory was so cooperative and helpful, mm-hmm. and uh, wanted to uh, to do everything they possibly could yeah. to aid me in my uh, efforts. Yeah. Uh, to well, I think they were very generous with the construction of many cyclotrons through the world at that. And so, yes. Yeah, so yeah. I went back and uh, got the plans ready and began to get the stuff ready. Yeah. Then the war broke out. Oh yes. So uh, now, before the war, about uh, six months before war broke out when it was apparent that war was almost inevitable. Mm -hmm. Uh, Henry Tizard, who was a chemist and the advisor on scientific matters Mm -hmm. to the British government, thought uh, it would be wise to get uh, scientists involved in uh, uh, war projects before Mm -hmm. war actually hit us. Mm -hmm. uh, a gang of us who'd been in the Cavendish, Cockroft and uh, and Skinner and me and mm-hmm. uh, half a dozen other people mm-hmm. were all uh, initiated into the secrets of radar. Oh, yes. Uh, and uh, spent some time at the uh, change stations that had been built along the, uh, the east coast of, uh, of Britain to detect uh, aircraft and learnt uh, how to operate them and uh, what was involved in them. 
And then immediately that war broke out, uh, I undertook to develop uh, means for generating very short wavelengths yeah. because it was quite obvious to us by then that one couldn't have airborne, satisfactory yeah. airborne radar using mm. the wavelengths that were available mm. at the time with yes. ordinary uh, vacuum tubes. Mm. Uh, it was just impossible to make them small mm. enough and when one made them small enough and with small yeah. enough clearances they produce zero yeah. power. Yes, <laughs> that's right. So yeah. they, it was an yeah. impossible mm -hmm. task. The uh, Klystron had been invented mm -hmm. uh, and was a useful tool, yeah. but only produced watts of power. Mm -hmm. And uh, we wanted uh, hundreds of uh, kilowatts yes. in pulses, of course. And with very short wavelengths. And uh, with wavelength. We set our mm -hmm. eyes on 10 centimeters. Mm -hmm. Uh, the first uh, high power that we got was with a special klystron that was built by Sayers, mm -hmm. produced about a, a kilowatt or a bit mm -hmm. more than a kilowatt yeah. of, uh, of uh, power at mm -hmm. eight centimeters. And we used that to get our first echoes from aircraft. Oh, yeah. The... Uh, uh, problem really was in convincing people that one would get echoes at these short mm -hmm. wavelengths. Mm -hmm. The uh, optical people argued that uh, like the uh, reflection of light from a, a piece of silver, mm -hmm. one would only get spots of, uh, mm -hmm. of reflection yeah. because the rest would yeah. be uh, diffusely yeah. scattered. And uh, one would uh, therefore get, find it very difficult to get enough return mm. signal to, uh, but we showed at once that uh, one mm. could get uh, uh, signals from aircraft with just one kilowatt of power oh, yes. at eight mm -hmm. centimetres, and also get good uh, echoes from ships at sea right mm. out to the horizon. Oh yes. But unfortunately, this was of course by that time the Battle of Britain. Yes. We'd taken the equipment which we'd built up in an old sound locator yeah. mounting down to Portsmouth, the naval yeah. base, to do these experiments on uh, mm. echoes from ships. And uh, the Germans came over and blew it to bits. They oh, hit, yeah. hit, with a, hit the equipment mm. with a bomb. Oh, And terrible. so we lost it. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, by that time, the... Uh, uh, Boot and uh, Randall, who were working in the yeah. lab, and whom I'd given the job of uh, of uh, trying to make the magnetron uh, work at low mm. wavelengths yeah. and with high power. Uh, Randall had the brilliant idea of not having one single resonator as one used to in a magnetron in those days, just mm. a U-shaped uh, yeah. resonator of surrounding the cathode with resonators, mm -hmm. you see. And so he uh, made this, uh, this uh, multi-electrode uh, device and it worked at once and yeah. produced uh, many kilowatts of power yeah. in pious pulses. And this uh, transformed, of course, uh, yeah. centimeter wave radar I wish we had uh, just a dollar for every magnetron that's been sold since then. Oh, yes. <laughs> that, that was, of course, that magnetron just transformed. Uh, just yeah, made all the yeah, difference. Yes, transformed the whole field. Yeah. Uh, and uh, one had... Uh, microwave... Uh, microwaves uh, at uh, uh, very just, high power. Yes. Uh, uh, this, uh, it was... Uh, uh, that was... But then, uh, uh, of course, this was taken up enthusiastically by the military and mm -hmm. the... Uh, RAF were particularly yeah. cooperative. Yeah. The Navy was rather reluctant to yeah. give up its longer wave stuff, uh, but it, in the end it did do yeah. so. The, uh, and then I spent a good deal of my time uh, dashing about preaching the, to the military and yeah. uh, so on, the virtues of this new thing for all sorts of purposes, yeah. you know, anti-aircraft yeah. gunnery and uh, ship... Uh, 
uh, to the Navy yeah. ship gunnery, yeah. getting the range accurately and the distance accurately and the uh, position accurately. Yeah. And the, uh, so I, for a little while, I was dashing about the world, came across yeah. to America twice oh, yes. on this radar business, uh, mostly to Bell Telephone mm -hmm. Labs and to uh, uh, the MIT. Mm -hmm. Yes. Did you meet uh, Alvarez and McMillan at that, that time yeah, also? Yes, and yes. Loomis. Oh, yes, Loomis. Loomis. And, uh, of course, Ernest Lawrence figured very much yes. in the picture at that time, too. So, uh, uh, that was the picture. And then, uh, of course, the uh, uh, I realized that... Uh, the services, the military services, and the uh, uh, the uh, industrial people had really taken it over mm -hmm. by that time. So yeah. I got out of radar and went back to uh, yeah. uh, chasing fission energy. Oh yes, mm -hmm. and uh, as a result of the uh, paper of uh, Frisch and uh, of Piles in mm -hmm. my lab. Yes. They were the mm -hmm. By that time, Frisch had come to your laboratory. Yeah. Frisch had mm -hmm. come and mm -hmm. uh, as a guest. Yeah. But of course, he wasn't allowed to have anything to do with radar. It was too secret. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> Nor was so, the piles, you see. Uh, uh, so they set yeah. to work to do some calculations on the uh, yeah. nuclear weapon. Oh, yes which was non-secret. <laughs> yes, that's a very, very odd because it yeah. became so, uh, so ultra-secret. Uh, yeah. uh, but then they, uh, they worked out, you see, that if one could get pure 235, mm. then uh, uh, a lump mm. of uranium-235 weighing only about 10 kilograms mm -hmm. would be sufficient to... Uh, absorb the fast neutrons yeah. in the fission process mm -hmm. and uh, give you a, <coughs> an almighty big bang. Yeah. And they worked out uh, both the, uh, the critical size and, mm -hmm. the, uh, mm -hmm. and the yield, and they were wonderfully close. Yes. You know? It was really quite incredible. That, that's amazing yeah. from just a uh, yeah, yeah. uh, few calculations of the few atoms and neutrons yes. uh, you're able to arrive at those weights. Uh, That's right. Well, you see, they'd done this work but, uh, <sighs> when I was still doing radar. Yes. And then in 1941, I came across on radar business to the mm. States. Oh, yeah. And I was also asked to follow up because mm. we'd heard nothing back again. Mm -hmm. What had happened to the fresh and piles? Mm -hmm. uh, paper which yeah. we'd sent over, we'd mm -hmm. heard no comment at all. Oh yes. US. And so yeah. I went along to see Lyman Briggs, the who was chairman of the mm -hmm. committee that had been set up in the yeah. United States to look mm -hmm. at this thing. I don't know why Lyman Briggs had been made chairman. Yeah. He was a meteorologist and head of the standards club. Yes. Knew nothing about it. He really had no background in this. at all. No. Mm -hmm. But I went to see him and uh, I uh, found him uh, impossible man. Mm -hmm. He uh, had uh, received this uh, report and put it in his safe where he yeah. kept secret documents. Yeah. But, uh, he was involved in yes. this business and had never circulated to the members of the committee. And that's an amazing and, and so, unbelievable. Uh, I straightway went along to see Vannevar Bush and uh, Conant, mm -hmm. who were the advisors to the president on mm. yeah. uh, science and engineering matters, and uh, found uh, them very lukewarm and uninterested mm -hmm. because they said it's take too long. It'll, yeah. This is for the yeah. next war, not for this war. So, uh, being an impatient person, mm. I got on this train and went straight across to see Ernest Lawrence, whom I yeah. knew to be a real live wire, energetic yes. person. And I showed him this uh, report and told him what had happened. And he was very indignant and straightway yeah. came across to Washington. And uh, uh, 
in his usual uh, manner managed to get through all the barriers. <laughs> yes, well, that's the see the people who mattered. You see, yeah, that's uh, that's amazing. Uh, uh, but uh, those uh, people uh, at that time, uh, uh, Briggs and uh, particularly Conant, uh, I thought uh, was a little, a little pessimistic. Not only yes. if they made it work, well, they couldn't uh, as a chemist. Uh, he said, well, you really couldn't separate out the plutonium. Yeah. And uh, so he was rather negative on many res in many yes, respects, yes. even even, even after afterwards. Was started, yes. Yes. But uh, mm -hmm. fortunately, one did have uh, people like Ernest Lawrence and so on mm -hmm. who were enthusiasts yes. and really got the ball rolling. And, yes. And uh, the uh, folk at... Uh, in uh, New York also were keen on the uh, diffusion process oh, yeah. separation. Oh yeah, Dunning and other, Dunning. they're, they're yes. enthusiastic and, by uh, nature. Uh, mm -hmm. A great deal of work had been done in Oxford by yeah. Simon and uh, yeah. his colleagues who were low temperature people yeah. really. But they produced some, dia some uh, uh, diagra diaphragms for diffusion. Mm. Yeah. Which weren't very good. Mm -hmm. But of course, the people over here, they uh, straightway got onto this uh, this uh, powder metal energy yes. and mm -hmm. produced diaphragms of, mm -hmm. of any sort of porosity that one wanted. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, that was uh, uh, very was good. The, uh, and, uh, I can remember uh, General very well. I was mm -hmm. with Ernest Lawrence and uh, General Groves came to Berkeley and he uh, pulled out of his pocket, he pulled, pulled out a piece of stuff that looked just like uh, a sheet of uh, oh, yeah. aluminum mm -hmm. or something of that sort uh -huh. and uh, showed it to us and said, this is the stuff we're going to use in the diffusion. Oh, yeah. And then he produced a uh, report on the a piece of paper with the report of the preliminary uh, results of uh, testing this diagram oh, yeah. and uh, did one or two diagrams on it mm. and then he uh, mm. what's mm. that a fire oh, it's or? just a fire engine going yeah. there and then uh, he uh, took this piece of paper that, uh, this was all in the open air. Yeah. It was nice weather, we were talking yeah. in the open air. And he put the piece of paper on the ground, took out a matchbox and, uh, and set light to this piece of paper. <laughs> I said, what did you do that for? I said, it would have been interesting uh, archive. He said, yeah. I don't want any written records of this work. <laughs> And I said, why not? He said, I always, he said, I'm dreaming all the time of the congressional investigation yes. that'll take place after the war if we fail in this chair. Yes. <laughs> yes, he was always <laughs> conscious of that. Uh, and yeah. uh, it was too bad. Oh, there was a very valuable piece of archival material, his, yeah. very valuable historical. Uh, uh, now, Groves, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, wasn't liked by uh, most of the scientists, yeah, but yeah. I got on very well yeah. with Groves, mm -hmm. and so did Ernest. Yes. Ernest Lawrence. And oh, he, yes, Ernest uh, got along very well with Yes, him, right? and so yeah. uh, the, uh, you know, there was no strain. Yeah. And, uh, uh, Groves was always very frank with both of us. Yes. Well, that that was uh, that was an interesting uh, story. There, incidentally, on that uh, that material, it was nickel powder. Uh, I believe a good deal of that nickel powder was produced by the Mond Company That's in right. uh, in England. That's uh, right. That turned out to have, by coincidence, exactly the right properties. Uh, had to be yeah. other thing changes made and so on, but. That was fortunate to have an industrial yes. source of that material yes, available. Without, uh, yeah, without having to set something yeah. fresh up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so, that yeah. I think uh, yeah. is uh, the end of the story of me yeah. as a as a uh, scientist in uh, England. Yes. Uh, so I was. Uh, I did uh, build and go on to build in England. Yeah. I had yeah. the I 
independently of Ed McMillan and mm -hmm. uh, the Russian, what was his name, Gopner, uh, I had uh, ideas about a proton synchrotron. Oh, yes. And discussed them with Ernest Lawrence and, okay. and uh, went back to England after mm -hmm. the war to build a small proton. Oh, yes. Synchrotron in, uh, in uh, Birmingham. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which was just for uh, one GV. And this, uh, after time, worked mm -hmm. all right. Yes. But of course, by that time, Berkeley had got the eight uh, billion volt yes. machine going, mm -hmm. and ours was just a little baby. <laughs> yes. yes, they went on to uh, these big machines right after the war. Yes, yes. yes. So, it was, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, how long did you uh, uh, stay in England then after the war? I was went? there for uh, all yeah. uh, altogether. Mm -hmm. Uh, after the war, I stayed five years. Five years? Yeah, until 1950. Oh, yes. And then I went back to Australia. Oh, yes. Because they wanted to mm -hmm. found this new university in mm -hmm. uh, Canberra, the capital city of the world. Oh, yes. And they founded it as a Institute of Advanced Studies. Oh, yes. And uh, with no undergraduates, just mm -hmm. uh, graduate students. And this interested me, so uh, I went and uh, there were, after some years of haggling, <laughs> yes. mm -hmm. but uh, there was uh, Howard Florey, the man who yeah. discovered, or rather made penicillin available. Yes, he, he was the one. Yeah, he who was, was uh, my colleague in England together with uh, an historian named Hancock who really planned this new yeah. university mm -hmm. in England. We did the planning in England. Yes. And uh, then uh, used to make visits out to mm -hmm. Australia. Yes. Well, uh, the Australian embassy has uh, furnished me a lot of uh, information on both you and Flory and yeah. your work uh, there. Mm -hmm. So I, I got to appreciate the great contributions that Flory made also. Yes. And, uh, yes, uh, yes they, he was... Uh, uh, Florey and I, of course, we had, when I went, we came down from the hills, uh, from the countryside, mm -hmm. and I went to high school. Oh, yeah. I uh, lived in the same uh, suburb of Adelaide as Florey. Oh, yeah. But uh, he went to St. Peter's College, which was a snooty school, you uh, see. Uh -huh. I went to just the state <laughs> Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> and... Uh, but we knew one, really, yeah, you right. see, even in those days. Yeah. And uh, we were both interested in science. Mm -hmm. and then when we uh, got to England, he was a little older than me. Mm -hmm. When we got to England, we joined up then right. again. Because I was anxious to use the cyclotron for medical purposes as well as oh, for yeah. uh, physics. Um, yeah. In the, like the Donner lab. Yes. Well, let's see. Yes. And then, uh, of course, uh, then the uh, the university there at Canberra did uh, uh, was essentially uh, founded as a graduate school. Uh, That's right. That's uh, right. Stay. How long did you stay uh, there? Well, uh, I, until I reached until the you retiring retired. age of mm -hmm. 65. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, and, uh, and then mm -hmm. I uh, went mm -hmm. to uh, South Australia as governor. Yes, I, uh, I, I thought uh, that was a ra rather I interesting... I got this uh, offer and I, uh, you know, uh, it was quite clear to me that the university by that time uh, would rather have my the space that I occupied in my company. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, were you... Uh, so uh, I moved out, you yeah. see, to mm -hmm. Adelaide for five years. But yeah. I went back again afterwards. Oh, yes. yeah. And, and uh, they gave me a laboratory and a secretary and an yeah. assistant, and I was able to carry on so experimental work and a field that I'd been interested in for many years on the... What happened when ions, positive ions, yeah. uh, hit a metal surface, and the scattering of the ions oh, yeah. at low energies, oh, yeah. right down to mm. virtually zero energy. Yeah. Mm. 
and we, I measured the energy of the ions that were scattered mm -hmm. and used a single crystal scattering yeah. of, from various metals and uh, also uh, uh, polycrystalline uh, targets yeah. and uh, observed very strongly this channeling effect of the mm -hmm. uh, ions going right into the metal. Oh, yes. And then, uh, penetrating right in a long channel in the metal. This was uh, quite uh, quite interesting work yeah. indeed. The, and the scattering uh, uh, measured the energy of the scattered particles by bending them through 180 degrees mm -hmm. in a uh, one upon r squared uh, electric field. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, which for, it enables you to use a whole uh, whole semi sphere mm -hmm. and get a lot more particles yeah. therefore oh, yeah. uh, which is coming out yeah. at uh, various angles and focus them down again at the other end yes well and I, I also found that uh, one could use a, a an electron multiplier yeah. uh, and have the ions hit the uh, the uh, first electrode mm -hmm. in a beryllium copper multiplier oh. and could detect the ions uh, uh, every one. You never missed a single one. Well, the, uh, every ion was countable, oh. which was uh, a very nice, uh, oh, even actually. right down to very low energy. Yes, that's a fantastic it accomplishment. Re it released some electrons. Yeah. And uh, made itself visible as an electron cascade. Right. So uh, it was. It so was you really. Uh, and I was able to get on with this quietly in a corner. You see. Yes. Well, that's a fantastic, <laughs> uh, interesting uh, scientific work there. And of course, uh, this related to, I suppose, related to uh, you know some of the new work in solid state physics. That's uh, those, very, uh, much so. very much so, and yeah. uh, and which has had tremendous and application. And uh, you see, there was a. Mm -hmm. One of the departments that I set up there was geophysics. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, this was also interesting from the point of view of the structure of uh, many kinds of, uh, of rock. Oh, yes. Uh, and uh, we learned a lot, for instance, about such things as the heat conductivity in rocks oh, yeah. and what affected it. Mm -hmm. So uh, you really covered a w wide variety of uh, uh, scientific well, one work. Well, you had to do what one yeah. could do. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it was no good uh, yeah. trying to uh, do things on a very large scale. It yeah. was uh, just impossible in Australia. Yes. Yeah. Well, this, uh, this has been a marvelous uh, story of your career and uh, all of your contributions, uh, Dr. Oliphant. And I certainly want, on behalf of our group, we want to thank you very much uh, for consenting to this uh, interview. And I'm sure this, uh, this tape will uh, add a good deal to our uh, archival materials for the future. Thank you very much.